Yeah, hello everyone. So today I'm going to be talking about the impact of uh, fossils on our understanding of uh, past evolutionary change. So in the last 30 years or so, there's been a whole host of new methods to look at um, trait evolution and diversification on phylogenies. And this has um, really kind of revolutionised the way in which we can uh, account for uh, species history and understand different <coughs> tempo and modes of evolution. But a slight irony about this is that the vast majority of these methods have used extant phylogenies only, and a lot of the kind of original understanding and the hypotheses we test um, came from uh, things like this, so the tempo mode of evolu in evolution by George Gaylord Simpson. And a lot of the things he says in this book we done using examples from the fossil record. And on top of that, we also know that if we just look at extant species only, we're only getting a tiny uh, snapshot of the diversity of life. So perhaps only 1% of um, all the species that have ever, ever existed. And we can um, enrich this by incorporating the fossil record. So depending on who you talk to and how pessimistic you are, um, we can do this to a varying degree. So what I'm interested in here is kind of bringing these two ideas together, looking at extant species and incorporating fossils to see how this either enriches or perhaps changes our interpretation of uh, evolutionary change. And a typical way in which we do this is to look at something like body mass. So we take uh, this trait, which is kind of really biologically informative because it uh, correlates with a whole host of things that we find interesting, like metabolism and life history. And it's also very useful um, because on a practical level, it's something we can actually infer from the fossil record. Um, we can either just look at fossils directly and see how big they were, or um, infer from one part of their body a kind of estimate of um, overall body mass. So in the last uh, few years, people have kind of taken this approach and used phylogenies uh, alongside fossils and seen how this has either changed or um, not changed our interpretations based on living species only. And just to take um, one example from this, this is a study from last year, and uh, they're looking at the uh, body uh, size evolution in sloths. And what they found is, if you just look at extant species in this kind of typical molecular um, phylogenetic way, uh, we get a signal of uh, evolutionary stasis in body size. But if we actually incorporate fossils into our analyses, it completely changes our interpretation. We get a directional trend coming from that. So here we're interested in looking at uh, this kind of pattern in Afropherian mammals. And so this is just kind of an overview of what we did. So we took uh, the Afropheria, um, produced phylogenies both containing fossils and extant species only, and then using those two phylogenies compared um, how we can study things like rates of evolution and ancestral size estimation, which are typical things we'd look at with these kind of methods. So this is just a brief introduction to the Afrotheria. So this is a clade that's only really been recognised um, in the last few years by molecular phylogenetics. And there's kind of a fundamental uh, difference in their body size, which is quite interesting in itself, in that uh, we have these larger body taxa, so sort of things like the manatees and the elephants and the hyraxes. These are all kind of comparatively much larger than uh, the tenrex, um, elephant shrews and the uh, golden moles. And these kind of split phylogenetically as well. So this recently, uh, recent molecular phylogeny um, shows this fundamental split where we get this clade over here with all the large body animals, and then over here, with the exception of the um, aardvark, all these things are much, much smaller. There's also been some work done on their phylogeny in terms of um, cladistic morphological characters. So this contains both um, living and extinct species in this analysis. And because these two things exist, it means we can incorporate them both together to do what's known as a total evidence analysis. So this allows us to use both um, the molecular clock and the morphological clock to do a divergence time analysis that includes fossils as tips. So this is really important for our next stage we were interested in. And this method was pioneered um, a couple of years ago by Rolquist. So that's the first one we did, was to produce the phylogenies, both the uh, total evidence phylogeny and the extant only molecular phylogeny. 
And this is the uh, results of phylogeny we got. You probably can't really read much of the detail on here, but there's not a lot of surprises. Um, we get this kind of large, larger body clade down here, and then the smaller body taxa kind of separate um, at the other side of the phylogeny. So the first thing we were interested in looking at was rates of evolution. How does this um, look when we just have extant species only? And perhaps unsurprisingly, we get this huge burst of evolution leading to the larger body taxa, including the elephants. So this would kind of fit into what we would expect. We'd expect the ancestral size to be quite small. And uh, we know that all these taxa down here are still quite small. So it just makes sense that we get this burst of evolution. So how does this change when we incorporate fossils? Basically not at all, in that we get the same result and on the same branch, to the same magnitude, you see this burst of evolution uh, leading to this larger body plate. And I'll be coming back to reasons why that might be the case a bit later on. So the next thing we we're interested in was ancestral size estimation. So this is looking at the ancestral atrotheria and how big or small it was. The way we typically do this is by applying a Brownian motion model. So this model um, basically estimates rates of change for a trait through the phylogeny. <coughs> and a major assumption of it is that it's, uh, there is no rate variation throughout the tree. And as we just saw with the rates of evolution analysis, that's clearly not true. We're getting a lot of uh, variation. And so we can take this process where we just sample from this normal distribution expecting a a uh, homogeneous process and make it more biologically realistic. And one way we can do this is by um, incorporating heavier tails onto this to allow this rate volatility throughout the tree. And um, we implemented this in a model that's known as stable traits that uh, has been published recently. And what we find is that this model that takes into account uh, rate variation throughout the tree actually fits better than the traditional Brownian motion model. And um, so this is for the analysis of no fossils. What we find is there's a tenfold difference in the estimate of ancestral size, so that we get um, a much smaller, possibly more biologically realistic estimate when we incorporate rate variation into our analyses. So again, we're interested in comparing these results from uh, living species only with uh, what happens when we incorporate fossils. And once again, there's absolutely no change. And uh, we get identical results. So the same traits model fits better. We get very, very similar estimates of ancestral size. So the major theme we kind of got from this was that model effects were much more important than fossil effects when we're looking at both rate variation throughout the tree and ancestral size estimation. So if we kind of like go to one extreme, we could just say that Fossils aren't really having an effect, and we could just get everything we need to know from living taxa only. But I really don't think that's the case, and there's been other studies, like I showed previously, where this is not true. I think what's more realistic is this is kind of a Goldilocks case, where the fossil record is fitting perfectly into what we know from living species. So, for example, there's no species of uh, elephant shuri from the fossil record that weighs five tons or something that would completely throw our analysis um, of kilter. One, thing's, one thing that fossils do do that's really important is they increase our uncertainty <coughs> around um, estimates. So this is just a, I think this is from the ancestral size estimation. There's a great uh, decrease in our uncertainty and confidence interval around those estimates when we're incorporating fossils. And this is probably because we've got fossils that are closer to the uh, root of the tree. So even in the case where they're not overturning our understanding, they're important to kind of enrich and increase uh, precision in what we're inferring from uh, species. So just in conclusion, atherium body mass is a Goldilocks case where fossils fit perfectly into what we know from living taxa. And model selection, rather than the inclusion or exclusion of fossils, can actually have a larger influence on our reconstruction patterns than including fossils. Having said that, fossils will always incre increase our confidence and precision in these type of analyses. That's it, thank you very much.